Hey, Jeff Rick here with the Q. We are on the ground at the Cosmopolitan Hotel in lovely Las Vegas at the Predix. Uh, first Predix Developer Show 2016. 1,700 people for the first developer show. I still find that hard to believe. But we're joined with the next guest, Matthias Hellman, the Chief Data Officer for GE Oil and Gas. Welcome. Thank you. So exciting times. You got 1,700 people here in all the sessions learning about how they can develop in the Predix platform. Who would have thought three years ago that, right. uh, that we'd be here today? Yeah, it's all about scale, right? It's unbelievable how it uh, turns out to be uh, an event that actually is not just 1,700 people, but 1,700 people from all over the world. Right, and developers, and everyone is competing for the developers' hearts and mind. Everybody wants developers, because everybody's got an ecosystem and a platform that they're trying to get people to develop too. Yeah. So what is it that you think is attracting such a great turnout here for your first event? Well, I think it's uh, Predix overall is, is a pretty unique entity for us. Uh, and people realize this now, it's not just for GE, but it's for, truly for the world something that has unique capabilities and features when you think about industrial internet that nobody else has to offer. And that's where you see people getting interested and trying it out, kicking the tires, and uh, ultimately now competing, uh, building applications on top of Predix. Right, and you're in oil and gas, and oil and gas is just this, this funny industry um, with such high variability on the price, right? The, yep. the, the price of a, of, a, of a barrel of oil changes from not that long ago, it was over $100, then it dropped down to 26. 26 at how low it got, yeah, we'll now it's back to, back to like 45, yeah. that was over 50. So from a manufacturing point of view, and these guys are building facilities and production to try to figure out how to make money at a, at a market rate that they don't have a ton of input on, they got to look for every ounce of efficiency that they can and probably be constantly changing the drivers for how they run their actual manufacturing and operations. That's exactly right. I mean, it's, uh, volatility is the name of the game in oil and gas. Uh, not just that the oil price has dropped from you know, well over 100 down to 26 the beginning of the year, also the recoveries from 26 back to 45 are pretty, pretty quick. So uh, for our customers, for our industry overall, one of the key drivers is to be flexible, nimble, very fast in the way you ramp down and ramp up um, your capacity because the worst thing can happen is you, you slim down, you, you know, tighten the belt, but then once the recovery comes is you're not ready and you're not ready to execute. Yeah, that's interesting. So they're really dynamically tuning their outputs based on real-time economic factors. It has exactly. nothing to do with kind of what they could get out of that hole in the ground but if they really wanted to. You know, it's the output is, that counts. Uh, but think about it more about the investment levels, right? And the, and the investments in the CapEx and operating expenses in times where oil price is seeing volatility like this is, you need to look for new business models and operating models that allow you to be extremely flexible in the way you operate so you stay ultimately afloat, right? And, and be a profitable business over a longer term. And uh, that's one of the key things that we think about. Right. Uh, our customer base needs to be able to operate prof uh, effectively and efficiently and profitably at $30 a barrel, as well as 45, 50, or even 80 or 90. And in times like this, where, and, and let's be clear, right? You know, the oil and gas industry is an, is an asset intense industry. I mean, there's lots Absolutely. of equipment, costs a lot of money. So in times like this, you need to be smart about your investment levels, right. and where you deploy resources, and, and how do you make the most out of the money you invest. Right, the other thing is they got to go where the oil is and, and you got to try new places. So in terms of, of kind of difficulty of climactic conditions on that gear, which then has to be connected to computer gear and software, totally unique challenge than in you know, a pristine office or you know, a climate controlled data center where you've got all these devices in this edge. So you know, tell us about some of these edge specific challenges because you've got to get compute there, you've got to get connectivity there, and you've got to get yeah. storage there. And then you've got to figure out how much of it's there at the bottom of the deep sea uh, well yeah, yeah. versus you know, in Texas or, or you know, back at the data center and how do they move that compute and store and decide which goes where? Right, so look, this, uh, I mean, GE is always looking for technological challenges. So that's now a sweet spot. You, know, you, you mentioned subsea, subsea sensors, how do we understand what's happening in, in subsea reservoirs, uh, what kind of sensors do we need to be able to operate continuously in a harsh environment? Um, operate also at an operating cost that is ultimately uh, working uh, with 
uh, the oil price environment you're in. And these are the items and the hardware that uh, we care about, especially in, in my business. We care heavily about sensors and condition monitoring capabilities, which are behind your back here. Right, right. Where we establish an operating rhythm and transparency and visibility uh, in items that you normally don't see. Right. right. And that's where you need sensors and measures and uh, condition monitoring that allow you to then ultimately uh, you know, make the right decisions about your, the operating configuration of your production environment. And I think a lot of people kind of understand the sensor concept, but they don't understand how many other kind of layers there are in that communication chain between the sensors and the controllers and the fabric and the network and the individual right. device and then kind of the system device and then the field. There's a whole bunch of ways that you can slice and dice and organize this, this output and this organization, really the orchestration of this system. That's right. Well, it's the, uh, I mean, we call it the on-ramp. You know, the on-ramp and one of the key drivers for the on-ramp is obviously is to be able to scale this, right? In today's environment, you're looking at uh, you know, replenishment times of you know, one second intervals, right? Uh, with thousands of tags being connected uh, to the internet, and then you have to make it cyber secure. Right? And no, nobody wants small to- Small little detail. Small little, little pes detail. That pesky security that, uh, thing. <laughs> when, when, when you collect reservoir information, I mean, that's a core DNA of every oil and gas producer in the world. That needs to be something that uh, they want to protect by all means. Uh -huh. And uh, we need to have technology, we have to have the means to provide them this confidence level that their data is secure and, um, and that they can ultimately you know, utilize that data in, in an environment that, you know, where they have complete privacy around it. Right. So just love to get some of your insight stories from the field, if you will. I'm sure you're out talking to customers all the time. When, when they start to integrate and, and put some of this stuff together, what, what are some of the things that are coming back like, wow, you yeah. know, I, I didn't know this could happen, or wow, I never really thought of it that way, or wow, now I can get beyond worrying about squeezing out a little bit more operational efficiency, which is good and worth a lot of money, yeah. but now I can start, you know, I can try and change the lens in the way that I run my business. Right. Well, it's, you know, we heard this this morning in the, in, the, in the keynote session is, there's a very profound difference when it comes to the industrial internet, is the amount of data once you turn these assets, these machines on, on that uh, you're capturing, is just tremendous. I mean, it's horrendous as for how much data comes in, right? Now, the second piece to it is, the equipment was designed to operate efficiently, right? I mean, you're looking basically for a piece of equipment that on the normal circumstances, one's perfect. I mean, so you're basically looking at a, at a piece of equipment, you're collecting all this data, and you don't and really find running. something for it. It keeps on running, <laughs> so there's nothing to really look for. So you're looking literally for the needle in the haystack, right? But this piece of information ultimately, if you get it, can then drive this massive productivity improvement. So industrial internet, massive amount of data. In oil and gas, a further complication is, as you said, is we're not in the shiny office in Las Vegas, downtown San Francisco, or Chicago, Boston, is we are in kind of the rough place of the world where you gotta think about connectivity. Whether you're in Africa, whether you're in Latin America, you know, even if you're in the North Sea, um, it's, these are areas where you need to think about connectivity and that's where we establish with our partners connectivity environments to be able to service our customers, right? Um, and then second, around this, as I said, is too much data can also be right. difficult to digest. So what are the compression methodologies that you need to deploy in order to ensure that you really look at the really relevant data, not just everything that is creating just noise? Right. And uh, we have done this. I mean, if you look at um, the um, equipment that in the oil and gas industry is deployed by GE, uh, especially around turbo machinery, um, uh, our turbines, you know, you know, they're creating quite a bit of data. Uh, I mean, just to give you a ballpark reference is, is our equipment in the field generates as much, as much data as Facebook does in a whole day. They got 1.6 billion users. We've got about 15,000. Turbines out there. It just gives and the day to day, the day to day comparison is pretty right? close. Yeah, so we so said. Yeah. But you know, it's basically the same kind of data creation. Right. Right. Now, not all the data is useful. Now, right. on Facebook, all the pictures are important. They're, they're stored all, every single wherever. one. Now, we have to make sure that all the data <laughs> that we're collecting is we're just filtering out the important piece. Right. And and our data scientists, our engineers, think about compression methodologies, filtering methodologies to in, to establish kind of the right data and filtering out the noise so that actually we can focus on the real things. Right, right. Because one of the things that we see with operators in the field, when everything is blinking, 
right? You see, you don't see the uh, the forest because you know you're, you're, to, you're too close to the trees. Right, right. So, give you the last word before we're uh, we're out of time for people that didn't make it here to uh, to transform. Share a little bit of kind of what's the vibe. You know, it's the first one. Kind of some of the hallway chatter and some of the conversations yeah. that you're having to share to people that they should probably come next year. Yeah. Well, I think it's, uh, it's, it's amazing that we have lots of developers here who truly think in business use cases or customer use cases. So it, it is truly uh, amazing to see that it's, that it's not really kind of, kind of a little kind of laboratory experience anymore. I mean, people come here from customers, from partners, always I partners with true use cases in the oil and gas industry and where they're trying to get their hands on. How can I use critics and the operating system capabilities that uh, G is offering in, in the real world? And um, you know, I can say for the oil and gas business that uh, we probably have more use cases or we have people to staff against them right now, which is a good problem to That's have. That's a good problem to have. So I mean, if, if we have 1,700 people this year, we probably should be hitting like 3,500 next year, just double it. I don't doubt it. I mean, the, the rooms are packed. I went in a couple session rooms yep. uh, earlier today, and you know, I was in the um, the one with the uh, the, the digital twin, and yeah. uh, you know, people were taking pictures of the slides <laughs> and right. paying close attention. Yeah, yeah. and then the, 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 the Dojo one is interesting, where we're bringing customers and partners in, and they're sitting for a week in a room and basically building a real application, right? Right. So no more just you know kicking the tires, doing the real thing, actually right. the real test drive. Right, and that's the test of a platform is other people are building applications on that's it, right? Because right. nobody's got a line item budget for a new platform, yeah. right? It doesn't doesn't exist. Yeah, it's, a, it's a pretty. Um, this is, we, you know we went through our bumps. We had our speed bumps along the right, way. Right. Right. Uh, I think as we are, you know, just timing wise and the scale we have now and the experience, the lessons learned. We're you know, certainly ahead of um, the rest of the pack and uh, bringing partners like Microsoft on board uh, you know, allows us to then you know, you know, bring other folks on board because they say, is, what the heck, why should I uh, invest in a platform if right. I can build the application that actually drives productivity. Right, all right. Well, Matthias, thanks for stopping by. Appreciate it. And uh, it's a real pleasure. It's real oil and gas. It's real industry right here. This That's is right. big, heavy stuff. He's got a little demo over here and all the boys are hanging out and girls playing with the toys, which is what we all like to do. So thanks, thanks again, all appreciate pleasure. it. All right, Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We're at Predix Transform at the Cosmo in Las Vegas. Thanks for watching.